Hello and welcome to a new series of lectures that I'm going to be doing on the subject of contract law. When it comes to analysing any given contract at all, the first thing that we need to understand is the different elements that actually make up a contract itself. And there are four elements which make up any given contract, and so that is where we're going to start this lecture. There are four key elements to any contract under English law. And these are offer, acceptance, consideration, and the intention to create legal relations, which is often abbreviated to ICLR. And those are the things that we're going to be covering over the next few lectures. But for the time being, we're focusing on the first of these, which is an offer. So the first thing we need to do is actually define our terms. And so an offer can be defined as a definite promise to be bound if certain terms are accepted. So if I offer to buy something for £10, then that is a clear indication that I'm going to be bound by those particular terms. And this can actually be distinguished from a willingness to enter into negotiations. And that idea that you're in negotiations, but you may not necessarily have made an offer yet, is known in legal terms as an invitation to treat. Now, an offer can be a direct offer, so I could make an offer to you to buy something of yours, for example, or it can be to the world at large. And that's a very unusual circumstance, but it does come up in probably the most famous case of all in contract law, and one that you might well have already heard of, and that is Carlyle and Carbolic Smokewall Company. To give you a quick background on the facts of this particular case, Carbolic Smokeball Company put an advertisement in the newspaper to basically say that their smoke ball would stop you contracting the flu. Now, Mrs. Carlyle believed this advert and she bought one of the smoke balls and eventually she contracted flu. And the important thing was that there was considered to be an offer to the world within this advertisement because there was a reward that was promised to anyone who used the smoke, smoke ball as intended but did end up contracting the flu. And if that happened, then that person was promised £100. And to show how serious the company was, they had actually put £1,000 into the bank. And Carlyle tried to claim this reward. The Carbolic Smokeball Company tried to deny this on various um, terms. They eventually failed. And it was decided in this particular case that as well as there being a possibility of a direct offer from one person to another, it was also possible that there could be an offer to the entire world in these particular circumstances. And so Carlyle wouldn't have to do things like make her acceptance of the offer declared. And we'll see that in future lectures, how acceptance can be built into that. But for the time being, we can just simply say that an offer can be direct or it can potentially be to the world at large. Now, one of the things that we just talked about in the last slide is the idea of an invitation to treat. And this is where there hasn't actually been an offer yet, but the parties are sort of still in negotiations. And the classic quote that's often used in this regard is from the 1834 case of Timothy and Simpson. And one of the lawyers in the particular case gave the example that if a man advertises goods at a certain price, I have a right to go into his shop and demand the article at the price marked. And the judge in this particular case record, retorted, no, if you do, he has a right to turn you out. In other words, you can't just go into a shop and demand something at a particular price. Instead, the goods that are advertised in a particular shop are just an openness to negotiations. And so it is actually the person who is buying something from the shop who is making the offer and therefore the um, shopkeeper themselves has the option to either accept that offer, which they obviously normally will do, but they can also potentially decline that offer as well. So the classic examples are advertisements in Partridge and Crittenden. There was an advertisement for a bird in a magazine. The person was prosecuted for selling birds under a particular act, but the judge decided in the case that this shouldn't stand because they weren't, they weren't offering uh, to sell the birds, they were instead um, an invitation to treat, in other words, an openness to negotiations, and so they couldn't actually be convicted. This would apply still in the modern day to things that are advertised online. Um, so you might see on Instagram or something, a shop is advertising certain goods, and that is not an offer for you to then accept and buy the goods. 
Instead, it's an invitation for you to treat in order for you to go and place your order. And then the online retailer would then be able to decide if they wanted to accept or decline that offer. Of course, most of it's automated and they will be normally accept the offer. But you can imagine a situation where they run out of a particular certain, uh, certain goods and therefore they decline the offer. And so it leaves the advantage with the retailer in that situation. Similar thing happens with goods displayed in a shop. The classic case in this is Pharmaceutical Society and Boots Cash Chemist from 1952. We also have Fisher and Bell, which is to do with the sale of a flick knife as well. And kind of a similar situation to Partridge and Crittenden, where the attempt was made to prosecute someone for selling something which they shouldn't have been selling. And instead, it was decided that this was actually an invitation to treat. And therefore, the person wasn't selling the goods that they were accused of selling. Now, in other situations, it can actually be very difficult to tell the difference between an invitation to treat and an offer. Often the parties in, say, a commercial contract will be bargaining for an extended period of time, and it's not quite clear where the negotiations end and an actual offer materialises. And so in that situation, it's necessary to try and look at the facts of the case and try and work out if there has been an offer within that definition that we gave right at the start of the lecture. So the parties might still be negotiating, as was the case in Harvey and Facey. Um, in that particular case, it's quite interesting to read, mainly because it's to do with the purchasing of land as well. And so something that's serious, it's often going to be considered that the parties might be in negotiations for an extended period of time. On the other hand, there may well also have been a firm offer and acceptance, as in the case of Big and Boyd Gibbons, and so it's necessarily necessary to try and look at the objective facts of the case and decide for yourselves in a particular problem question whether an offer has been made. And one of the important things, as we saw in the Daytech case from 2007, is that just because the word offer is actually used within the particular documentation, that is not necessarily definitive in a legal sense as to whether there has actually been an offer. It's still going to be up to the courts to try and make a decision in this regard. And in a similar way, in a problem question, it will be up to you to try and make a decision about whether an offer has been made within the remit of that definition we gave right at the start. One of the interesting areas is auctions, and this is often a particularly uh, popular area for um, questions to be set in contract law exams and courseworks. And the way that auctions work are a little bit unique in terms of the way that they interact with offers and invitations to treat. Now, generally speaking, a bid that is made by someone who is attending an auction is an offer that is accepted by the auctioneer when they bang the hammer. So say they are advertising a piece of furniture. You put in a bid for £200 for that piece of furniture. That is your offer when the um, auctioneer crashes down his hammer and says sold, then that is the acceptance of the offer. And that's the classic formulation that we get from Payne and Cave from 1789. Now, in a similar way, and we can take this from sort of those previous cases of Partridge and Crittenden, Fisher and Bell, an advertisement that goods will be sold on a certain date is not particularly binding. So we saw that from Harris and Nickerson in 1873. And that makes a lot of sense. Again, this is an advertisement so it is an openness to negotiations more than anything else. However, there is a particular exception with auctions that is always worth bearing in mind. And this is the idea of an item that is being sold without reserve. Very simply, a reserve can be put on a particular item. So you can imagine um, in a sort of very expensive sale, say, for example, a Monet painting that might sell for millions of pounds. They might want to put a reserve on it because say there was only a couple of people bidding on this particular painting and it only sold for say 50 pounds when it was actually worth you know three million then they wouldn't be very happy about that and so the person who is selling the painting might put a reserve on the item so that they, the top bid will only be accepted if it goes above that particular price so if you were selling a monet painting and you wanted to make sure that it got sold for a good price, you might put a reserve on it, say, for £2 million. In legal terms, and in particular the context of contract law, it becomes very interesting when items are sold without any reserve on them. In other words, the highest bid will win. 
and so if that mono painting only gets two bids and it gets sold for £10, then that is what it will be sold as. And this basically amounts to a collateral contract between the auctioneer and the highest bid, because then it will be sold at that particular price, and so the idea that something is sold without reserve is basically um, a, an indication that the highest bid will always be accepted. And so what we have there is kind of like a side contract to the actual auction itself that is a promise from the auctioneer that the highest bid will actually win. And so if a person makes the highest bid and the auctioneer refuses to sell it, then the person who made that highest bid would actually be able to sue the auctioneer. Thank you very much for tuning into this first ever episode in my series on contract law and I hope that you've learned a lot about offers within any given contract from this lecture. Now in a essay or a problem question that deals with contract law, looking at the offer and acceptance are probably going to be the first things that you'll have to do. And so understanding that distinction between an offer and an invitation to treat is really important. Also, if you're doing a piece of coursework that's early on in the academic year, the chances are that it will cover one of those specialist subjects like auctions, where you have to be very careful about distinguishing between when the offer happens and when the acceptance happens. So make sure that you're on the lookout for that. Anyway, if you're interested in these, this series on contract law, then make sure to subscribe and hit the bell button so that you're notified whenever there is a new video on the channel. Also, if you are new and you have any questions, then make sure to leave a comment below and also like the video so that it helps others to find it as well. Thank you very much and I'll see you in the next lecture where we will be covering acceptance. Bye!